Let me get right into it, okay? It's been a very big week, the biggest at Manila scene in many years now. Um, there haven't been many controversies, it seems, just coming out of the ASEAN summit. What is your general assessment of how the, the, the meetings have gone? Um, I think, um, you know, like most ASEAN meetings, uh, it's usually a celebration mm -hmm. of coming together and, uh, you know, basically moving forward a common agenda based on consensus. Uh, that's the ASEAN way of doing things. Um, but this year in particular is a celebration of ASEAN's 50th anniversary, right. right? So this is a, a big deal. Special. Yes, absolutely. On the celebration side more mm -hmm. than anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's something worth celebrating. I mean, you know, this is the longest running grouping amongst developing countries mm -hmm. in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so they've done well to have survived this long, but more than that, they have a lot of um, achievements. Um, initially, they dealt mostly with um, trying to provide a forum to keep the peace, uh, because it was born, you know, during the Vietnam War. And it mm -hmm. has since evolved. It's evolved mm -hmm. to take on a much more ambitious agenda on the economic Side. issues, mm -hmm. maybe, yes, that's mm -hmm. right. So it has actually grown over time, mm -hmm. uh, and it, but it's grown at a pace that's manageable. Uh, you know, we've seen how in Europe, for instance, being overly ambitious mm -hmm. can lead to fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, Brexit is just one example, but there's other divisions that have uh, taken place internally mm -hmm. because of the overly ambitious agenda over a too short period of time. Mm -hmm. ASEAN has avoided that. Right? So if I were to read between the lines, just for this particular summit that's happening right now in Manila, do I take it to mean you didn't have high expectations to begin with? <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, uh, <laughs> I think uh, the agenda this time has focused on inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to increase inclusive growth. We've seen mm -hmm. this region growing very rapidly, mm -hmm. but not enough uh, of an impact on the poorest mm -hmm. uh, within these countries. Mm -hmm. Inequality is still a problem within countries and between mm -hmm. ASEAN members. So I think it wants to deal with inclusion mm -hmm. um, in the context of promoting MSMEs, mm -hmm. right? Micro and small medium enterprises, which is the backbone of a lot of these mm -hmm. countries. Almost 90% of uh, Philippines firms are MSMEs. So, you know, you kind of avoid or ignore them. Uh, but also in the context of uh, changing technologies, mm -hmm. which can be disruptive, mm -hmm. uh, can create uh, difficulties in the labor market, mm -hmm. but can also create opportunities if you respond proactively. But as an economist, how can you explain the fact that we have such high growth, so we are the block that's growing the most in the world, and you have this huge inequalities and huge exclusion? Right. I think, uh, well, that's a good question. I think uh, that comes to the nub of the issue about inclusive growth, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you have growth that's driven mostly uh, by capital mm -hmm. uh, owners, right? Not enough uh, participation from the largest part of your uh, labor force, then you get this widening disparity mm -hmm. within the country, mm -hmm. right? You have to remove obstacles uh, that limit access uh, to uh, work mm -hmm. as well as progression within the workplace. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of uh, obstacles that need to be dealt with. Uh, not and do you think that mm -hmm. the region is particularly weak in terms of uh, reducing these barriers? Uh, I think the, this region has had a history of uh, you know, trying to address these issues gradually. So okay. they're still persistent. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a lot of social reforms in the labor market, but not at the pace or the level in Western advanced Europe. countries. Okay. Yes, that's right. So they're catching up to some extent. They're catching up fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, you say that one of ASEAN's greatest success is uh, tariff reduction. Sure. To be specific, on average, about 96% of ASEAN member states, uh, member state tariff lines are sure. now at zero. Mm -hmm. And this figure is projected to increase next year as well. I believe the goal is closer to uh, 98 point something percentage. Sure. Tariff lines down to zero across 98% of uh, products. Why? Tell us a bit of the backstory. Why was this easier to work out? Okay, so when uh, the ASEAN countries got together in 1992, 
mm -hmm. to uh, form the ASEAN Free Trade Area. Mm -hmm. That was the first project. Uh, they focused in on tariffs because tariffs was the main barrier at that time, mm -hmm. right? So, and tariffs are very transparent, mm -hmm. right? They're easy to measure, identify, you can set a schedule for reducing them over time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's not an opaque type of instrument, it's very clear. And so they have met those targets, right? But more importantly, they've also reduced tariffs, not just with each other, but they've multilateralized them. Mm -hmm. So they've offered them to non-members, yes. right? They've done this because I think the countries realize that most of their trade is actually with outside countries, mm -hmm. not within ASEAN countries, right? Outside, mem uh, outside nations, not all members. Mm -hmm. So they haven't wanted to become a fortress Europe type mm -hmm. uh, situation. Mm -hmm. They've been very outward looking. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's why they've been quite successful. They've set clear targets mm -hmm. and they've met them. According to your report, it's about 70% of intra-ASEAN trade, so including these multilateral members, actually have the, the same sort of most favored nation rate of 0%. Correct. Most of the trade, so not just this 98% of the ASEAN, but 70% of right. all trade. Exactly. Yeah. So this is why they haven't had the kind of trade diversion mm -hmm. and uh, you know difficulties going forward. They've actually used the ASEAN or AFTA uh, project mm -hmm. to open up globally. Mm -hmm. So for ASEAN, regionalism has been a means rather than an end, right? It's used regional... It, it itself is not the end goal. That's right. It's used it to globalize. Mm. And that's why they've done so well, mm, right? That's why they've had yeah. so much uh, growth in trade. See, intra-ASEAN trade hasn't grown very much. It's still at about 25%, mm. and stubbornly so for mm. 20 years, right? And that's not a bad thing. Right, because mm -hmm. they haven't tried to artificially induce Make that it, trade. Exactly. Yeah, okay. they've kept uh, the doors mm -hmm. open. Trade has grown, mm -hmm. even if intra-ASEAN trade shares have remained relatively mm -hmm. unchanged. Overall trade has grown very sharply, mm -hmm. and that's what really matters. Can you compare that to the European model then? Okay, the European model has been inward-looking, mm. right? Uh, that's one difference, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are much bigger, they mm. can self-sustain. ASEAN is not. Mm. big enough in terms of a critical mm. mass. Mm -hmm. um, it has to look outside, right? Uh, another difference is that uh, ASEAN's always been market-driven, mm -hmm. right? The government hasn't played such a huge role. Mm -hmm. It's not like the European case, right? And it's also institution light, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, we don't have a Brussels. We have mm. a small secretariat in Jakarta mm -hmm. that's deliberately underpowered, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no... Uh, appetite to give up sovereignty, mm -hmm. right, to a centralized supernatural body. body. Yeah, mm. not yet, and maybe not for a long time. <laughs> and given what's happened in Europe, maybe Possibly not for a very never. Long time. never. <laughs> yeah, maybe never. So <laughs> they must reconsider that. Yeah, so it's on working well the way it is. Uh, Jay, on the downside is we're seeing a rise in non-tariff barriers. Mm, in right. fact, exactly. by your estimates. Yeah. Um, between 2000 and 2015, non-tariff barriers jumped from 1,634 to 5,975. Wow. That is a lot of barriers. First question, what kind of barriers are these? Okay, all right. So uh, the thing about non-tariff barriers is that it's a very wide spectrum. Mm -hmm. Everything except tariffs, right? And the second thing, uh, just to put things in context, is that this is a moving target. Right? Mm. Uh, the new barriers that come up all the time. So this is the difficulty with dealing with uh, NTBs or non-tariff barriers. But uh, let me say this. You start off really with non-tariff measures, right? Mm -hmm. And these measures are usually designed with a very specific purpose in mind that could be quite useful, right? For instance, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards mm -hmm. that deal with health mm -hmm. and safety issues standards. for vegetables and fruit etc now these have uh, good uses mm. to them they, they have a good objective but uh, they can be abused mm -hmm. in the way they're implemented mm -hmm. right so a measure can turn into a barrier mm. at the implementation stage mm -hmm. and uh, abused by say domestic producers to protect their production mm. 
from imports, mm -hmm. right? You, you'd be familiar with what happened in the Philippines with bananas, mm -hmm. right? The same thing happened. I was just about to yeah. ask, what right. particular industries are these okay. uh, non-tariff barriers most susceptible to? Okay, well, they cut across lots mm. of industries. Uh, phytosanitary standards and so on, of course, have a focus on uh, food and agriculture products. But things like anti-dumping duties, which is mm -hmm. one of the most common uh, mm -hmm. non-tariff barrier, can cut mm -hmm. across any industry. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's been quite prevalent in manufacturing, mm -hmm. right? And this has been used and abused mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I think the reason is um, the reduction in tariffs and the rise in non-tariff barriers are not independent events. Mm -hmm. They're totally Inversely proportional. <laughs> related, that's right. One <laughs> has increased because the others come down, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem there is that tariffs provide less protection than non-tariff barriers and tariffs mm -hmm. are more transparent. Mm -hmm. Non-tariff barriers are opaque. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the problem ASEAN is dealing with now is despite this huge success on tarifs, <laughs> non-tariff have barriers have easier may, to have, exactly. yeah, may have more than but, offset it. That's the But challenge. do you believe that the growth in non-tariff barriers is driven by the fact that there's increased globalization, there's increased trade, and so you need much more measures, you need more quality control, you need more restrictive labor policies? Or does, is that not really necessarily the case? Right. I think uh, the rise in trade and so on that you described that's happened um, has seen a lot of benefits mm -hmm. uh, and people have been encouraged by it. But there have been some sectors that have lost, some sectors that have won, mm -hmm. right? See, the problem is the winners mm. uh, are not as vocal as the losers, mm -hmm. right? The costs are usually highly concentrated in a few industries, mm -hmm. right? Such as, would you? Okay, agriculture has okay. been one clearly, right? Some types of manufacturing, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so they have tried to actually lobby mm. uh, politicians mm -hmm. for protection, mm -hmm. to try and minimize more disruption mm. to production and employment. Mm -hmm. And they have succeeded. So the benefits are thinly spread. Mm. All consumers enjoy slightly cheaper goods, but uh, the costs are highly concentrated. Mm -hmm. And so they have a bigger incentive to group uh, mm. and lobby. Mm -hmm. Consumers don't have that much of an incentive. They just go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one other thing uh, that uh, Danny alluded to was the restrictive labor practices. And another thing I took away from your study was that uh, ASEAN member states have more restrictive services policies uh, in general than any other region in the world except for the Gulf states. Why right. is that? Okay, so services and services related issues has always been a sensitive area in mm -hmm. this region. Uh, this is a highly diverse region. In fact, the diversity in almost any measure is greater than Europe mm -hmm. and indeed almost any other region in the world, right? So you've got you know, small rich countries like mm. Singapore sitting next to poor populous mm. countries like Indonesia, mm -hmm. right? So dealing with labor mobility has always been sensitive and difficult. Different political systems, mm -hmm. different languages, different currencies. And on top of that, all those things <laughs> as well. Exactly, that's right. So with all that diversity, uh, moving forward on areas that are sensitive becomes extra difficult. Mm. But ASEAN has been narrowing the gaps mm -hmm. between countries, at mm -hmm. least economically, right? Uh, and to some extent socially as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, uh, the s poorest countries are growing faster than the richer countries. Mm -hmm. So by definition, income gaps are narrowing, mm -hmm. right? But there's all kinds of gaps, including mm -hmm. skill gaps and so on, that need to be addressed. And this will take time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they are trying to address services, mm -hmm. but it'll move a lot more slowly than the tremendous success ASEAN has had with goods. Mm -hmm. That's something that's going to be a reality. And your study also mentioned that you have uh, not necessarily better, but some more um, policies on more skilled labor migration. Right. But yeah. we don't really have a lot on low skilled workers, which right. is actually on the agenda of t this ASEAN summit. Right. But it hasn't, do you believe that it's been touched upon in the past couple of days, this protection for low skilled migrant workers? Sure. I think what's been addressed at the summit is the protection issue, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, most of the labor movement within ASEAN 
are in the low skill category, mm -hmm. right? And most of that is unrecorded, right? Mm -hmm. And this is uh, not an acceptable mm -hmm. situation, not for sending countries or receiving countries, mm -hmm. right? For sending countries, these workers are highly vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? They have no protections if they're not recorded. They can be subject to all kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, wage abuse and physical abuse mm -hmm. even, right? Yeah. And it's the Philippines and Indonesia that are actually the top the two most, yes. sending that's countries. Right. Yes. That's right. They're the uh, top two. But there's also a lot of uh, uh, Myanmarese in Thailand, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. and in the Indo-Chinese region. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also, what I want to say is for the receiving countries, this is not a good thing either, mm -hmm. right? It's a security yeah. issue, issue, right? Yes. You don't know who's within mm -hmm. your borders mm -hmm. and you don't know what they're up to. So both the uh, uh, demand and supply sides have an incentive to deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. The reason why it's difficult is because um, receiving countries need these workers, sending countries need to send them. Mm -hmm. If they formalize it, it becomes a sensitive domestic political issue. Mm. So everyone turns a blind eye mm -hmm. uh, and tries to mm. muddle through. Mm -hmm. But I think the time has come now to try and deal with it for, as I, like I said, for both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Sending and receiving country. To formalize yeah. it, you mean? To formalize mm -hmm. it as much as you can mm -hmm. so that these uh, workers have protections, these countries know who's within their mm -hmm. borders, and also uh, ensure that, um, you know, uh, we take advantage of having these workers mm -hmm. working as efficiently and productively for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But back to my question, do you think that was addressed? Uh, I don't think the formalization issue uh, probably was very much addressed uh, in the sense that they're not mm -hmm. trying to suddenly have a policy mm -hmm. on low-skilled labor movements. Mm -hmm. The policy that ASEAN has is on skilled labor movements, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they're dealing with it through these mutual recognition mm -hmm. arrangements, yes. MRAs, yes. yeah. Uh, and they're going slowly uh, and cautiously. Uh, in fact, not a single person really has moved, mm. I think, under mm -hmm. these MRAs yet. Okay. But there's still a lot of movements, mm. right? There are a lot of skilled labor movements. I mean, uh, being in the Philippines, you know mm -hmm. how many, uh, you know, Filipino nurses are in Singapore mm -hmm. and the like, yeah. But also low-skilled workers, which are dealt with in bilateral arrangements. Mm -hmm. So there are bilateral mm -hmm. ways of dealing with it. The difficulty is producing a regional agreement that addresses this common standard mm -hmm. across all countries, mm -hmm. each with different expectations needs and, and needs. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, Everyone right. has vast uh, differing needs that's and right. obviously mm. uh, letting, opening it up to a free market it will mean that some countries will be on the losing end, mm -hmm. which are more developed nations, I suppose. Jay, let's talk a little bit about uh, one of the big highlights this week, President Donald Trump coming to Manila to right. not just attend the East Asia Summit, but also uh, conduct a bilateral meeting with President Duterte. By all indications, he's brought his protectionist rhetoric to Asia. <laughs> he said, look, I will always put America first. I will, not, I will no longer sign any unfavorable uh, free trade agreements, and I expect trade reciprocity to some extent. What should take Asia, particularly the Philippines, take away from that? Okay, so I think uh, President Trump's uh, approach quite clearly now is a preference for bilateralism, mm -hmm. right? So he's not against freeing up trade. He wants to do it bilaterally. And he wants to protect and secure U.S. interests, right, going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, every country is trying to do the same. For its own country. For its own uh, country. <laughs> Uh, except that the power balance is not equal. Mm. So mm -hmm. this is the challenge um, uh, uh, being posed by this new approach mm -hmm. by you know, a major trading nation dealing with smaller partners. So, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no compulsion for countries to simply concede. Mm -hmm. They can protect their interests. They just have to be uh, bargaining hard and understanding the calculus of uh, the true motivations mm -hmm. behind uh, a lot of these agreements. They're not always economic, they could be strategic, they could be political, so when you weigh them all up together, there's things you can negotiate on that should produce mutual gains, right? I mean, trade is hardly ever fair, but the thing about trade is that it's mutually beneficial, mm -hmm. right? Both parties benefit in net terms, right? And that should still be the guiding principle going forward, whether it's bilateralism or multilateralism mm -hmm. or regionalism, right? 
Well, as President Trump shakes things up, what opportunities, or perhaps the better question is, what challenges do multilateral trade agreements like the RCEP and the TPP mm. present, RCEP Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that's by all indications being led by Beijing? Uh, okay, <laughs> I won't <laughs> comment that last statement. I think uh, RCEP is supposed to be led by ASEAN, mm -hmm. right? But uh, uh, but there are clear, you know, uh, differences in terms mm -hmm. of size mm -hmm. within the membership. Sure. Uh, okay. So what does this mean for them? I think this creates um, an opportunity for them, mm -hmm. right, to move forward, to try and uh, set the rules of the trading game, mm -hmm. right? In fact, uh, President Obama had said this earlier about TPP, right? That uh, we want to be able to set the rules, right? Mm -hmm. There are rules, but the question is who sets them. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think uh, RCEP, uh, if they can deal with their uh, internal difficulties, getting a very diverse set of countries again to agree mm -hmm. on a common set of rules, if they can overcome that and deal with you know, India, for instance, that are a bit less progressive than other countries, including the newest members of ASEAN, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar. If you can bring them along mm -hmm. to agree to this, I think there's a great opportunity to uh, create the world's biggest free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you know, uh, in Da Nang, at mm -hmm. the APEC summit, the uh, uh, TPP countries mm. without the US also came to an in-principle agreement mm -hmm. to move forward without the U.S. Without the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that creates a challenge and opportunity for <laughs> RCEP to also yes. speed up. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess and more that, specifically, sorry. I wanted to know whether we can envision a world where, for instance, a country like the Philippines can both be a part of RCEP and gain from it, and at the same time have a bilateral exclusive relationship with the U.S. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. There's nothing... Or is that too big an ambition? Uh, no, no, no. I think that should be the ambition, mm. right? I mean, you want to ensure that you have um, uh, secure market access mm -hmm. to a very important market for the U.S. And if you can't get that through a multilateral agreement, um, mm. you should try and have a bilateral FDA uh, for that uh, access and then not limit your other options, mm -hmm. opportunities, right? Yeah. And remember, all these countries you're talking about are also members of the WTO, mm -hmm. right? And although the WTO has been slightly dormant uh, <laughs> and in the background, they still uh, set, you know, uh, the rules, the rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. for trade, mm -hmm. and they provide a fabulous dispute settlement mechanism. Mm -hmm. So when you do have difficulties, and every country will face them, mm -hmm. you can go to an uh, arbiter, present your case, and have it resolved. Mm -hmm. And they... Uh, that function, I That's think, is sometimes right. forgotten, but mm -hmm. it's critical mm -hmm. in ensuring a world that doesn't, you know, melt down into a trade mm -hmm. war every time you have mm -hmm. difficulties with a trading partner. Yeah. So speaking of these trade blocks, what's the status on the AEC, so the ASEAN Economic Community, which was right. supposed to take place by 2015, we're already in 2018 already, right, right. and so the new blueprint is for 2025. Correct. Do you think this will actually occur? Are there concrete steps that are being taken to, to ensure that this will really happen by 2025? Right. So, uh, so as you said, you're right. They wanted to concluded in 2015, mm -hmm. um, I think they knew they could never really get <laughs> there, right? Remember, the first deadline was 2020, right? Mm -hmm. And they thought even that was too ambitious, so let's move it forward. If you're not going to get to 2020, <laughs> let's move it forward to create momentum, yeah. okay. right? Uh, reform momentum. And they did do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so now I think the wording is it was established Mm -hmm. but in not principle. In <laughs> <laughs> the qualifier yeah. being in principle, in principle it's, but not been yet implemented. Yes. it's been agreed on. It's been agreed on. So uh, to, the 2025 blueprint mm -hmm. is to implement it, right? And they have tried to deal with a number of these um, uh, issues of non-compliance, mm -hmm. right? But uh, at the end of the day, ASEAN's uh, modus operandi is not stick, it's carrot, right? Uh, they want to encourage countries mm. to see the mm -hmm. benefits of doing these things mm -hmm. and hope that they will, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so this has benefits. It avoids conflict, uh, allows people to move at their own pace, but it also has risks, which is, you know, 
things can slow down dramatically, there can be a lot of non-compliance, mm -hmm. uh, and there's no way of actually properly addressing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly, as you were talking about earlier, there's no one institutional body quite like Brussels, mm. like what right. Brussels exactly. is to the European yeah. Union. Sure. Although um, ASEAN does have a dispute settlement mechanism also mm. that's been revamped for the AEC but never been used. You see, so it's not in the culture. Mm. Uh, that's the difference, yes. Um, and it doesn't have the kind of resources to create huge institutional structures, mm -hmm. right? Remember, the rich countries in ASEAN are tiny, mm -hmm. right? Singapore, Brunei. Um, in, we don't have a France or Germany mm. to bankroll a Brussels, mm -hmm. right? And not only that, there's not <laughs> much appetite for it, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, these countries are not interested in coughing up, you know, billions of dollars to pay for a huge, you know, bureaucratic mm -hmm. uh, institution mm. uh, to run things. Right? But that, that's exactly the point. So how would this questioning of the European model actually affect the implementation of the ASEAN model? I think uh, the important I lesson. I think she there wants to know if some countries are having second minds, second, <laughs> second thoughts, thoughts about, about second minds, second exactly. thoughts about in <laughs> coming together as an economic mm -hmm. community. Okay. A lot of European effort to come Union. together and right. maybe some breaking up at one point. <laughs> okay, I think first uh, point is that when ASEAN says the economic community, it's not the same thing as what Europe means by mm. community, mm -hmm. right? The best example is labor, right? Yeah, so there's no free movement of labor on the agenda mm. okay so they mean different things right it's nowhere near as ambitious mm -hmm. as them right and i think um, there are good lessons to be learned by the european experience now right of the pace at which you should go when you have a diverse membership mm -hmm. right you go too fast and it can mm. fall apart mm -hmm. right yeah uh, or slowly start cracking and falling mm. apart it may not just collapse uh, but it slowly starts uh, you know, falling apart. So that's what ASEAN should take away mm -hmm. from that experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I think ASEAN has been more successful mm -hmm. than uh, Europe because it's moved at its own pace and it's been able to, to avoid mm -hmm. this kind of uh, rupture, mm -hmm. right, that we have seen. And it's not just Brexit, right? It's also the newest members not complying with mm. all these fiscal rules and budget deficits and so on. There's been a lot of stuff that's just not happened, mm. right? And um, so it's not just ASEAN uh, that has these difficulties. Everyone Questioning. has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jay, you think um, the Philippines, Manila, has uh, taken full advantage of its chairmanship of ASEAN this year? Have oh. we pushed as hard as we can on the things that need to be raised? I think uh, the Philippines has done a great job hosting ASEAN, mm -hmm. uh, you know. I think the Philippines is well suited to doing these sorts of things. Um, uh, Filipinos are very warm, welcoming people. I was at the summit yesterday and I thought everyone had a smile mm -hmm. on their face. Everyone's enjoying themselves. That's the default. It's, <laughs> That's right. It's, it's right. being widely described exactly. as a very cordial summit. Absolutely. It's a very absolutely. friendly summit. That's right. And I think people, that's important, right? Because it's about building bonds and relationships, mm. not just thrashing out difficult issues, but mm -hmm. to strengthen this bond, to deal with issues over time. Mm -hmm. And that's happened. Um, you know, every summit is never fully successful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always issues that don't get addressed. Um, I think there's very little this time on the ASEAN economic community, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, didn't see much we about that. Uh, but that might be because, you know, this is a journey uh, the celebration <laughs> at one level true but also a journey mm -hmm. right it's not a destination mm -hmm. a long journey mm -hmm. so you don't want to be stock taking every year mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. things can take time there might not be much progress from year to year but mm -hmm. as long as they keep moving mm -hmm. uh, in the right direction i mean they've mm -hmm. got to 2025 by their new uh, blueprint mm -hmm. so still some time to go uh, and i guess they're dealing with the inclusion issue now this mm. shifted focus a little bit uh, to try and focus in on this micro and small enterprises and mm. inclusion in the context of changing technology. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, sorry, but uh, nevertheless you say that it's all positive. There have actually been a lot of protests over the past few days. So sure. the first protest even before the summit was this 15.5 billion peso budget that we spent for hosting this. So that's just sure. a, you know, to add to Reg's question, was it worth it? <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, in I terms mean, of, well, I, I'll, I'll clarify that question. Was yeah. it worth it in terms of, let's say, the benefits that we could gain from the, the talks that we've had over the past couple of days? Sure. Of trade benefits or... Right. <laughs> I think time will tell, right? I mean, you can, we don't know right now. But I think, uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, this, uh, I think you spent uh, perhaps more than you expected because so many leaders turned mm. up. Mm. And that's a great success, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the kind of exposure... Shines a spotlight in the country. Yes. You, you, if mm. you want to pay for this exposure, you're going to probably cost you a lot more, yeah. actually, if you're going to buy, you know, advertising <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. So if you think in those terms, you know, there are spillovers uh, from foreign investment and uh, trade uh, that will take place over time. But I think there'll be more than offsetting these costs, uh, in my view. Mm -hmm. Jay, I want to talk about another area of expertise for the ADB. You've talked a lot and tackled the fourth industrial revolution, and I wanted your thoughts on how exactly that's going to impact a country like the Philippines that, of course, relies heavily on the BPO mm. sector, on outsourcing. Sure. Automation and robotics, are they a real threat? Okay, uh, automation, uh, artificial intelligence, and all forms uh, related to it, including robotics, is a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happening. It's happening, uh, affecting different industries uh, at different uh, degrees and at a different pace, right? Um, so uh, it will eventually affect even industries like BPOs, mm -hmm. right? And even higher level uh, uh, industries, uh, but that will take time, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, perhaps in the uh, initial wave, uh, it will be affecting more of the simple assembly activities, mm -hmm. the low skill activities, but uh, this will feed into other areas. Uh, but the important point in this joint report you mentioned with the World Economic Forum is that we need to start preparing now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, these things take time. Uh, getting the right skills developed involves long gestation periods. Mm -hmm. So we can't wait till when it affects you to start thinking about how you respond. Mm -hmm. You've got to start preparing to respond way before it starts affecting you. And that's the main message coming out of this report um, with the mm -hmm. World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, Colliers, which is um, a real estate research arm, published a report just last week that there's now a 7% vacancy, or they predict a 7% vacancy in office space rental because of this BPO slowdown. Right. So do you think that there will be other sectors that are affected by this fourth revolution? I think it's going to cut across a lot of sectors going forward, right? Again, a different pace mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of, you know, how much impact it has in the short run mm -hmm. versus the long run. But if uh, you know, you're well prepared to take mm -hmm. advantage of it, the net effect will be positive, mm -hmm. right? So that's, I think, the message from uh, this report. Mm -hmm. uh, and also a lot of recommendations within this report mm -hmm. that show how countries can go about making those changes mm -hmm. to take advantage of this. This will go, um, the embargo on this report is, will lift it. 5 p.m. Manila time, mm -hmm. and it'll be on the World Economic Forum website. Mm -hmm. So I encourage your oh, uh, viewers to get onto that website and mm -hmm. please read the report. It has an executive summary mm -hmm. that's very readable uh, mm -hmm. and just a couple of pages. Uh, and if they want to read but more details, they can actually download the whole report for free on the mm -hmm. World Economic Forum website. Excellent. Yeah. And lastly, Jay, your outlook on global trade uh, we're nearing the tail end, we are at the tail end of 2017. Are you more optimistic this year than you were last year? I remember at the start of the year there were a lot of concerns, perhaps we can call it noise, over the state of globalization given shifting sands in the U.S. Sure. Going to next year, where are you at? Okay, so uh, there's two aspects to this. One is, um, you know, the rhetoric, the sentiments, the statements, and then you have uh, the reality, mm -hmm. right? The reality is that it looks like the trade slowdown has bottomed out, right? And we've come, we've turned around, right? So uh, this uh, slowdown that took place over several years seems to have bottomed out. And Asia, and Southeast Asia in particular, is right in the center of this recovery mm -hmm. in trade mm -hmm. and investment. 
and this is a good thing. So Massive opportunities there. Yeah, despite all the rhetoric and the anti-globalization backlash, mm -hmm. the reality is things are getting better Still in better. terms of uh, the real data. And on that upbeat note, I'm going to end this conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Jay Menno, lead economist for the ADB. We appreciate your time today.